So to happier topics, uh, we're here today uh, for the Maritime Security Dialogue, uh, which brings together the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Naval Institute, uh, U.S. Naval Institute, two of the nation's most respected nonpartisan institutions, uh, to highlight the particular challenges facing the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard. Uh, from national level maritime policy to naval concept development and program design uh, and all of the various issues uh, facing our maritime forces. And given the budgetary challenge, the technological opportunities and then the strategic adjustments that are happening in today's uh, somewhat chaotic world, uh, the nature and the employment of U.S. maritime forces is undergoing significant change now and over the next 10 to 15 years. And so with these trends in mind, uh, CSIS and the Naval Institute uh, set up this, uh, this dialogue, this maritime security dialogue, as a forum uh, for public events, uh, interviews, uh, so we can bring in a, a wide range of leaders uh, to talk about maritime issues in a forum where you can really dig in in depth uh, and, and engage on these important issues. And the series is made possible by the support of the Lockheed Martin Corporation. We'd like to thank them for giving uh, for giving all of us the opportunity to have these discussions. So today, we have Vice Admiral Thomas Rowden, uh, who is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, he currently serves as uh, Commander of Naval Surface Forces, uh, Naval Surface Force U.S. Pacific Fleet, uh, and has, the, as I've just been hearing, uh, good housing out in San Diego and obviously a good climate, a little, a little, uh, a little drier, a little cooler than what we have here today. Uh, so we apologize for, for bringing you into this uh, in the summer. Uh, he served uh, just about everywhere uh, that you can serve as a naval officer with distinction and commanded at every level. He served on the Joint Staff, the CNO staff, uh, the Bureau of Naval Personnel as the assignment officer for the surface warfare. Um, he uh, commanded the Surface Warfare Officer School Command in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, I see you have a, a good... A, some good assignments there, obviously, a careful thought put into that career planning. And we're so happy to have him here today uh, and, and coming up in a, in a little bit to uh, help uh, further the discussion will be uh, Vice Admiral Pete Daly, CEO of the U.S. Naval Institute, who will help with, uh, with the Q&A and the discussion portion of today's event. Uh, and the Naval Institute has really been critical to this whole series. Um, so without too much further ado, Admiral. Thank you, Andrew. I can see if I can balance that. I'll put that right down there. Um, I sincerely uh, appreciate the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you today uh, talking about the Surface Force, uh, Pete, uh, and both CSIS, Andrew, the collaboration here and the opportunity, I think, really is, uh, is tremendous, and I thank you both uh, for the opportunity to spend some time. And I left Washington, D.C., uh, shoot, a year ago next week, I think, give or take. And uh, I arrived out in San Diego, and I relieved jo Tom Copeman on the 7th of August, uh, so 11 months ago. And in, uh, in that 11 months, it has rained in, Washington, in San Diego a grand total of three times. And so I've been following the weather patterns back here in Washington, and I was really excited because I was going to hop on the plane, I was going to come back here, and I was going to get rained on. And this is what I got today, typical heat and humidity. So nonetheless, if I could bring some of that rain back to San Diego, I'm sure that everybody would appreciate it because it is really drier than heck out there. Um, so as Andrew said, um, I'm the type commander for uh, the surface warfare community, uh, for, uh, for the Pacific, the, the forces in, the, in the, the surface forces in the Pacific. And I know that while that sounds like an exalted title, really what I do is I organize, train, and equip, maintain the majority of the warships in our Navy, certainly the warships that are out in the Pacific, uh, out in the Pacific region. Save for the aircraft carriers and the submarines uh, that belong to the other type commanders. Uh, my counterpart, uh, Vice Admiral Mike Connor, I understand was here in the, in the March and in, in the May time frame as part of this ongoing series. Surface ships occupy a critical position within our Navy's fleet architecture. We are a big part of carrying out what our recently released maritime strategy refers to as our core Navy functions of all domain access, naval presence, sea control, and power projection. 
An important thing to remember about sea power is that one of its major aims is to promote a security environment where war doesn't happen. In some cases, this is a function of preventative deployments, warships deployed uh, with combat power in a conventional deterrent role. In other cases, it's a function of reinforcing relationships with partners through continuous and routine operations and exercises. Should that deterrence fail, naval forces provide the nation the ability to protect its interests. Persistence, mobility, and combat power. These are the three hallmarks of the U.S. Navy surface force. And around these attributes are built our Navy's operational approach. Simply put, being there matters. Having the ability to be 600 miles from where you were yesterday matters. Being there with credible combat power matters. The slide behind me shows just a snapshot of where the surface Navy deployed around the world today is. We're in the South China Sea, the Red Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and all the waters in between. We operate forward. We are mobile and persistent. The surface force is uniquely poised and distributed throughout the world. In today's world, the persistence, mobility, and combat power of our fleet plays a large role in sustaining America's influence and protecting our globally arrayed interests. A good bit of this job falls to the surface force. And by this job, I mean sea control. And by sea control, I mean the ability to control areas of the sea when the nation calls. Sea control is not universal in either time or space. It is a condition that arises when our surface naval forces employ the tools of ballistic missile defense, air warfare, surface warfare, and undersea warfare in conjunction with other capabilities brought by our submarines, carriers, and other joint and combined forces to gain and maintain control of that chunk of the ocean required to enable operations, operations such as power projection. The tools we bring to this task are formidable. In, the surf in our surface fleet today exists more than 8,000 launchers, namely the individual cells of the numerous vertical launch systems residents in our cruisers and destroyers. From the decks of surface ships fly literally hundreds of aircraft, from embarked helicopters optimized to localize and neutralize, to unmanned aerial, aerial vehicles, to fixed-wing fighter bombers flying off our amphibious assault ships. In recent years, we have made an effort in time and money to modernize our, uh, modernize our, new sh our ships with new sophisticated computer suites, improved weapons and sensors and for all warfare areas to improve capability and capacity. What I'm describing to you are some of the components of the fleet architecture that enables our surface force to do its job, which boils down again to those four functions I spoke of earlier, all domain accents, naval presence, sea control, and power projection. We do that from a force of nearly 90 cruisers and destroyers, from more than 30 amphibious ships, and from a growing number of small surface combatants, the LCS and its follow-on, the new frigate program. Many of you have heard about the LCS program, uh, about how the LCS program has evolved into the frigate. That evolution is something that I am particularly proud of, not only because I think it was the right thing to do, but because the intellectual work that went into decisions on what upgraded capabilities the frigate would field led to an even greater conversation, and ultimately to the concept of distributed lethality. That's what I'll spend the remainder of my time talking about today. But before I dive into definitions and plans and all that, I want to describe the background and intellectual process that occurred. As a consequence of then Secretary Defense Hagel's direction to the Navy to make recommendations to him on how best to upgrade the lethality of LCS, we gathered in March of 2014 a talented group of operators and requirements people at the Naval War College in Newport for a series of war games. 
One of the excursions we pursued was how LCS, equipped with a medium-range surface-to-surface missile, with a range on the order of about 120 miles or so, would change the behavior of both the adversary commander and the friendly commander. The results were notable. First, the friendly commander immediately began to employ the LCS differently in the scenarios, moving from a niche presence role to an offensive warfighting role. This added flexibility in the force. This added flexibility in the force makes sense when you think about it, but seeing it play out before you in the game was even more telling. The second thing this capability did was that it added stress and complexity to the Red Force commander, who had to spend precious ISR resources trying to find these upgunned ships, ships that now represented a far more serious threat to his own fleet. Additionally, not only was he expending ISR resources, but also in attack planning, he had to distribute a limited number of weapons across a larger number of targets. Therein, diminishing the number of weapons available for target planning against any one target, which includes, of course, aircraft carriers, amphibious assault ships, and any of our other high-value ships. We took this nugget back to Washington, where I was then serving as N96, and we hashed it out among ourselves. As we did, the question occurred to us, why stop there? We had before us analytic evidence that suggested a series of important behavioral changes, both ours and theirs, that came from increasing the lethality of just one of our ships. So why not apply that same logic across the fleet? We know darn well that the threat is advancing in its ability to deny us freedom of maneuver. So why don't we go on the offensive, as it were, and begin to not only be more direct about the concept of offensive sea control, but also begin to create a series of operational problems that any adversary would have to consider. Why not change the calculus of our adversary? This discussion was the genesis of the distributed lethality concept, a simple notion that states that the surface fleet will, one, begin over time to opportunistically and economically increase the lethality of individual warships, essentially take what you have today and make it better. Two, operate those more lethal warships differently while still providing for high value warship defense in order to, three, provide a wider variety of mission tools to operational commanders, tools that, will, that help preserve the carrier's striking force for maximum warfighting effectiveness on high-end co complex warfighting operations. Increasing the lethality of individual warships something my friend and relief in N96, Pete Fanta, refers to as, if it floats, it fights, will require us to look at all manner of ways to repurpose existing weapons in unique and innovative ways, even as we get them to ships faster. Our priorities will concentrate first on ships that traditionally should have greater punch, our surface combatants such as cruisers, destroyers, and frigates, even as we consider lethality enhancements to our amphibious force ships. But while increasing warship lethality throughout the force is a good first step, it is suboptimal unless we operate that force differently. We need to begin making geography a virtue. We need to understand that the long lines of operation that we sometimes see as a disadvantage offer the opportunity to challenge adversaries from multiple axes. Put another way, a more powerful force distributed across a wider expanse of ocean creates complexity. If the threat represented by those other surface ships increases and we are able to spread the zone with those forces using the advantages of mobility conferred by the sea, we can not only hold a greater number of targets at risk in the sky, on the land, and on and under the sea, but we can also create an operational environment that potentially diminishes the risk to our high-value warships. Some of you be, may be a bit more skeptical about this idea, and you may be asking yourselves a number of very, very important questions, questions that must be asked and answered if distributed lethality is to ultimately achieve its aims. The first question some of you may be asking uh, is, uh, if this is such a good idea, why then isn't it a Navy-wide idea? The simple answer is that 
the Navy operates distributed today and with the ability to aggregate as the mission dictates, increasing warship lethality and then distributing that lethality wider, I believe, is at the heart of both the aviation and submarine communities, about the addition of the Joint Strike Fighter or the, or the Lorazin in aviation or the Virginia payload module in the submarine community. This concept is also alive and well in all of the discussions around the role of the Joint Forces. But the plain truth is that my job is to think about the surface forces, and that's where I spend a lot of my energy. Other tough and critical questions about distributed lethality include how our logistics force would support a more distributed posture, the degree to which our distributed forces rely upon and are vulnerable to disruptions in our satellite communication systems and networks, the effectiveness of distributed operations, whether independent, crisis tonight, or surface action groups in varying adversary ISR environments, and the overall impact of a more lethal sur sur surface force may have on adversaries' force posture and employment decisions. The short answer to these questions is that we are exploring the concept and the implications of the concept on the way we operate. I have suspicions and opinions, but those in inklings don't represent hard analytical understanding. Put another way, we are working to put some math behind what seems to be intuitively satisfying and have created a distributed lethality task force. The task force is made up of savvy warfighters and analysts from across the board and, and uh, broad, expansive experience, warfare community, and expertise. We have partnered with the Naval War College to conduct a series of war games designed to get at some of the questions I posed earlier. We had one earlier this spring, and we learned a little. We have one in two weeks, and we'll learn some more. And we'll get together again in October for a third game, and we'll continue to use wargaming to understand and think about how we will accomplish the missions we've been assigned. At the same time, we open the aperture for operational analysts at the Naval Postgraduate School to examine some of the discrete operational questions that must be answered in order to justify the direction we believe we want to go. Specifically under consideration are the logistics issues associated with a more distributed force, issues which more than any one factor, including resources, will limit the impact of a more lethal and distributed force. We aren't just studying uh, the problem academically. We are moving out smartly on experimentation with demonstration projects, opportunities to evaluate the impact of ideas we are generating. Last fall, we successfully demonstrated the launch of a medium-range surface-to-surface -surface missile from an LCS off the coast of San Diego. Some question the utility of essentially bolting a launcher onto a ship without integrating it into the combat system. But what the demonstration proved is the speed at which we could add cost-effective, off-the-shelf weapons to existing ships. Seven months later, we pulled it off. And for those of you familiar with the way things work, seven months is unheard of. We're working hard within the SWO community to demonstrate the capability to launch an anti-ship missile from one of our 8,000 VLS cells. We are determined to continue to investigate increasing target diversity across the entire standard missile family of weapons. Next, we are partnering with research and development organizations like ONR and DARPA to develop new ISR techniques and payloads to improve our ability to find and fix adversaries. Long range a long-range missile is extra weight without the ability to develop a coherent picture of your surroundings and identify bad guys in a sea of shipping. New ISR techniques and payloads partnered with existing systems will allow the force uh, to create accurate targeting in a dynamic environment. Executing strike missions in a dynamic environment is where the surface force is uniquely qualified. Surface ships are persistent in their readiness to service targets when targets are identified. Ships are able to rapidly execute these, mission ready, these missions ready once the data is received, giving a more immediate response than time traditionally required for strike planning. New ISR capability, payloads, and techniques are our, new, are our next great advantage in warfare. Our surface force is already trained on how to execute short-notice strike tasking, 
and it will be a natural shift to operators to add new types of targets. And while I won't camp out on the discussion of budget realities, the ability to modify existing weapons and technologies and deliver them quickly to the fleet removes years of research and development, testing, and money. We have many of the weapons and systems in place today to make a more distributed and lethal force achievable in the near term. The first part is distributed. And again, as you can see behind me, we are distributed, which is the first step. The surface force is built to accept change with modularity and launching systems and platforms like the LCS, with modest investments in weapons and ISR systems and sensors the surface force is better poised to support the roles outlined in the new maritime strategy. Distributed lethality is, uh, it, for the surface force is not a wholesale change. It's tweaking a smoothly running machine to add capability at minimal cost to us with big change to the adversary. Adding lethality does not translate to additional force structure. We have weapons, system, sensors, and systems in our inventory today that with modifications can make the lethal part of distributed lethality real. Pete Fanta, who I mentioned earlier, is the current director of surface warfare requirements. His staff and mine are joined at the hip, and his folks are scouring the development schedules of the programs they resource for opportunities to demonstrate or test elements of a more distributed surface architecture. We have, we have to view these opportunities in new and innovative ways to not only absolutely accomplish the performance goals of a program manager, but also to gain wisdom about distributed lethality. Keep in mind, nowhere in this discussion did I refer to distributed lethality as a strategy. It isn't. Bureaucratically, a more distributed and lethal force acts as an organizing principle because it touches all asset aspects of the enterprise. Acquisition, modernization, training, manning, all of it. Operationally, a more distributed and lethal force creates a series of capability upgrades available to commanders to apply to their strategies. But while distributed lethality is not a standalone strategy, it is related to strategy in an important way and I'd like to, then I'd like to conclude with. In the classic ends, ways, means formulation of strategy, when applied to my job of organizing, training, and equipping the surface force, a more lethal and distributed force is the end. How much more lethal? How much more distributed? That remains to be seen. But the process of answering those questions requires us to spend time considering the ways to achieve it, the systems, the weapons, the people, the platforms, and then thinking deeply about the priorities for aligning those needs, which then drives resources or the means. What I just suggested is something those who study such things, I believe, are rare. And that is a direct and meaningful linkage between strategy and resources. That is what we are aiming for in the surface force today. I plan on coming back to Washington in the January 16 timeframe at the Surface Navy Symposium to share where we are and the progress we've made as we plan in the near and far term to align and prioritize our activities to achieve this more distributed lethal force. In the meantime, I know we have a lot of work to do. I'm satisfied with the realism and the value of what we are suggesting, the support of Navy leadership, and the team and process we have in place to validate these ideas. Again, to CSIS, and the Naval Institute, thank you very much for the opportunity to spend some time with you today. I look forward to the conversation, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. That was great. Well, we're very happy to have uh, Admiral Roden here, and uh, appreciate you taking the time to fly all the way out from San Diego, weather or no weather. Uh, <laughs> this is a great opportunity to have a discussion and I thought I'd kick off with a couple questions to break the ice and then uh, open it up to the audience uh, for questions. Um, Admiral, recently uh, in the past couple months you sent out a message where you encouraged strongly all your commanders to put rounds out the barrel every Absolutely. day. 
and uh, you said, you know, conditions permitting, if you're at sea, I want rounds out the barrel. You've also uh, taken some steps to encourage uh, emphasis, re-emphasis on war fighting and tactics, and that's been loudly cheered. So 11 months on, are you happy with the mindset of the force, and, and can you talk about where they are and where you want them to be? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question, Pete. You know, um, when, when I was a young lieutenant commander, um, I was the combat system uh, officer on the USS Bunker Hill, working for a guy named Tom Marfiak, who happens to be sitting right here. Right there. And, and uh, we got underway every single day from Tokyo Wan, and, or every time we got underway from Tokyo Wan, whether we went right or left, uh, we were, um, we were uh, probably being flown on very rapidly, and we were probably tracking a submarine in the not too distant future. And what Tom Marfiak taught me, and what at Rod Rent before him and Phil Quas before him uh, taught me was that when you got underway from Tokyo One, you got underway with a knife in your teeth. And you didn't know what was coming at you, and, and you had to be ready for everything. And I think when the wall fell and, uh, and the Soviet Union dissolved, and we started to be more involved in different types of conflicts, um, the very th real threat that that Captain Tom Marfiak and I would see when we would get underway from Tokyo One uh, wasn't in their face, certainly like it was. And and as I kind of take a step back and I and I took the temperature of the force, um, and I, I I and I would go and I would talk to the wardrooms and I would talk to the chiefs mess. I didn't get the same sense that that they were getting underway with a knife in their teeth. And uh, and so I wanted to try to convey to them, hey. It's all about war fighting first. And I used to, I used to ask them what it's all about and, and when I would go in the war gyms. And sometimes I would get, you know, hey, it's all about war fighting first. And other times I would get different answers. And I would have to take them all up to the folks and I'd point to the VLS and I'd point to the five inch and I'd say, I think it's all about war fighting first. And so, and so that and a series and, and, in, the, and in the subsequent messages, and I touched on, a, on different things. That one happened to be put rounds out the barrel because I want everybody comfortable shooting, whether it's five inch or 50 cal or whatever it is in between. The first time they pull that trigger in anger, I want them to be comfortable with their, their ability to go do that and confident in their ability and confident in their machine's ability. Um, and in subsequent warfighting serials, I've addressed different aspects, all driving back to, hey, folks, it's all about warfighting first. That's what we are about not only in the surface force, but I think across the entire Navy, and I'm just trying to do my part as, a, as the leader of the surface force in order to concentrate them on those things. Thanks. Uh, a different topic, uh, you, you mentioned Pete Fanta. Recently, he was up appearing before the Sea Power and uh, Projection Forces Subcommittee uh, on the Hill with uh, Mr. Forbes. And uh, one of the things he said was that we need 40 ships that can deal simultaneously with a sophisticated ballistic missile threat, and at the same time, a cruise missile threat down lower on the surface, and to be able to do those together. And if you look at uh, what's going on with Aegis modernization, some of the delays that are in the offing perhaps on um, AMDR, mm -hmm. it appears that we may not be getting there very quickly. And I was going to ask you, as the surface force leader, how do you feel and what's your comfort level about dealing with the advanced uh, IAMD sure. threat? I think there's a number of ways that you have to look at addressing the, uh, addressing the, uh, the threats that exist and the threats that are growing. Uh, certainly, one of the paths that you have to take to addressing that threat is have you, do, you, do you have the right modernization and do you have the right modernization schedule in order to get the capability into the ships? And I think that's what we have a tendency to concentrate on. I think there are other ways also that we have to e spend equal time thinking about in order to be able to address those threats as the ebb and flow of, of the budget realities drive your, moderniz as it drive your modernization schedule either more rapidly or not as rapidly as obviously you'd like to drive it. And that is quite obviously, uh, or that is I think at the heart of that, is, is having uh, an organization that can develop the tactics, techniques, and procedures that in order to be able to start to balance out those, those, rea those budget realities with respect to the modernization. And so on the 9th of June, we stood up the Surface and Mine Warfighting Development Command, headed by Rear Admiral Jim Kilby out there in San Diego. And, and while certainly, I mean, I'd like to snap my fingers and say, hey, 
everything's fully modernized, the reality of it is you're going to move through it. So are there other things that you can do as you work on the modernization of the force to counter the adversary's actions in order to be able to continue to project power, see, execute, see control, and all those things? And I, I put that squarely in, uh, in, uh, in the lap of the Surface and Mine Warfighting Development Command, granted in its infancy, but certainly the acceleration that I've seen from, uh, from Admiral Kilby and his gang out there leads me to believe that while, while, we, while we still have to obviously concentrate on the modernization side, we can still address it in other ways with respect to the tactics, techniques, and procedures that we're using in our, in our force. Thanks. Uh, shifting one more time, and then we'll, last one I'll ask and open it up. Um, for ASW, you know, we've emerged from this fairly permissive period since 911, where we faced regional adversaries with kind of a medium to low capability. But sure. in the future, we could see it on the horizon, regional uh, adversaries that have a near peer capability, at least that they could concentrate uh, in their neighborhood. Right. So if you look at ASW, and you know, we went through this whole phase where you know, we had P3s flying over land. We went you know, several years there where we didn't fly up, didn't deploy a P3 squadron above C4. We had surface ships that had taken uh, sonarmen and, and, and used them for the mission at hand in the Gulf, which sometimes mm -hmm. was uh, you know, security ops and uh, boardings. So you're having to regain track a little bit could you tell us where your comfort level is in that mission area? Yeah, so, so my, uh, my most recent uh, warfare uh, serial, warfighting serial, uh, the unclassified title of it was uh, warfighting uh, serial number six. Uh, I, initially, uh, it was uh, titled ASW. And, uh, and, I, and as I was reviewing the context of that uh, warfighting serial, I changed it from ASW to uh, Warfighting serial number six, hunting and killing enemy submarines. I haven't talked about, and I haven't sent a warfighting serial out on uh, anti-surface warfare. Certainly one is coming, one's coming on integrated air and missile defense. But in, with respect to addressing the warfare areas, the first area that I wanted to address was anti-submarine warfare, because I see exactly what you described. Uh, our peer and near peer competitors are coming forward with a significant capability in the undersea domain. And, uh, and we in surface warfare need to ensure that we can execute our part. And so there's, and I saw at the, in that warfighting serial, A, I gave the, the commanding officers out there and the ASW officers uh, some things to think about and some direction associated with the concentration and the effort that I expect of them in this particular warfare area. Uh, beyond that, um, again, back to, um, Jim Kilby and his outfit, and prior to that, uh, Bill uh, Mers and the uh, Naval Mine and uh, Anti-Submarine Warfare Command out in San Diego, uh, their development of the warfare tactics and structures that have specific uh, levels of expertise in anti-submarine warfare. We put a significant number of those folks out in the fleet, and the feedback that I get universally with respect to the performance of the ships that have this expertise on it is that their anti-submarine warfare, cap uh, their ability to execute this particular very difficult warfare area is rising uh, significantly. So um, certainly a lot of work to do, I think, on the ASW side of the house for hunting and killing enemy submarines. And, uh, uh, but certainly we are focused on that. Not only, again, tactics, warfare, or tactics, techniques, and procedures side of the house, but also on the side with respect to the modernization, with respect to the ins installation of uh, QQ89, AV15 system, things like that. Great. I think now would be a good time to open it up and uh, ask to take uh, questions. How about in the back there? Um, thank you for the presentation. It was excellent. Um, <clears throat> my name's Con Nugent. I'm a consultant to the Gordon Foundation in Toronto. And Canadians look north very often for their security anxieties. And I'm wondering if you're planning on surface distribution contemplates the retreat of the ice pack and the increase of Russian military activities, submarine, surface, and air in the, in the area. Is that a, is that a five year out concern of, of, uh, on your watch? I, I think that certainly has to be part of the calculus. I mean, it's undeniable what's happening uh, in the Arctic. Uh, and, and certainly in the conversations that I've had with our leadership, uh, there is significant concentration on what's happening and, and the trade routes that are being opened up in the north. And so um, I, the short answer is it has to be part of the calculus, I think. Sir. 
put it over here. Sir, they're bringing it over. Peter Peddington, uh, Royal Navy retired. Thank you, Admiral. Because of my age, if you turn me upside down, you'll find engraved on my bottom, get the bear. What? I'm, I'm going to probably steer clear of that, but I'll, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> Always hack the bear. What if there are potential naval officers coming through from potential enemies that will have engraved on their bottoms, get the tanker, get the oiler? Get, get the tanker or the oiler. In other words, I'm talking about your distributive forces, but your lines of supply are the vulnerability. Absolutely. I, I think front and center, and as we look at distributing the force and distributing the lethality of the force, it not only creates complexities for our potential adversaries, but it also uh, creates complexities for us specifically associated with logistics. And, uh, and which is why, as I, as I gathered the, um, the specific topics this year uh, to be studied at the Naval Postgraduate School by the ops analyst folks that we have up there, uh, I centered them on this particular aspect. Because you just, can't, you just can't go to the ferry desk locker and say, hey, we're going to be able to just dump some ferry dust on that in order to be able to deliver the, the beans, bullets, and, uh, um, to the ships in a more distributed fashion. We're going to have to figure out how to go do that. And that absolutely is, is, is front and center in our minds with respect to how we, how we have to defend that logistics train as we operate distributed and continue to operate globally. Uh, Robbie? Admiral, good to see you, sir. Good, good to see you, Robbie. Congratulations on what you're doing on distributed warfare. I think it's great. Uh, I've got a question for you, though. Uh, CNO, CNO spoke recently and said that cyber warfare was one was and is one of his top priorities, very, very close to the top priority. And I got to tell you, when I think of distributed warfare, I, I think of things kinetic, things that go boom. So I guess the question to you is, how does cyber, how does offensive cyber factor into your thinking about distributed lethality as that applies to the surface Navy? How does offensive cyber or cyber defense? Offensive, offensive cyber. Um, that really, uh, in, in the near term, from my perspective, um, I would say that's uh, in, within the bailiwick of probably Jan Tig at 10th Fleet and maybe, uh, and maybe Mike Rogers at NSA from the offensive side. Um, certainly from the defensive perspective, uh, and defending our networks and defending our systems uh, front and center in my mind and how I need to work with not only Matt Kohler, the ID4, but also with Jan and also with, uh, with Twig Branch on the 2-6 on the two six side of the house to ensure that as he brings his programs along and, there's, and it's not 2-6 it's not resources and Warfighter and, and, and N9 resources. Uh, and, and we have, uh, in, the, in, the, in the years since we when I was the resource sponsor and beyond, one of the things that I've been very happy with is the communication, the increase in communication between the 2-6 resource organization and the N9 organization to understand that the vulnerabilities that, are, that we are, uh, understand are properly being addressed and resourced to the maximum extent that they can. Thanks, sir. Uh, Norm, Norman, did you have a question? Yes. Norman Polmar, question, sir. what is the can you give us some words on the day-to-day -day relationship that your headquarters has with mine and ASW command in San Diego? How close are you? Uh, how much do you input to them? Do they input to you? Yeah, that's a great question, Norm. And I, I guess the, the, the short answer is very close and growing a heck of a lot closer very, very fast. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, when we stood at the Surface Mine and Warfighting Development Command, um, we, uh, we took over the responsibility for the mine piece that was resident in the, not only in the, in the tactics, tactics and procedure, but also an operational role associated with that. Um, and I have talked uh, extensively with Mike Connor, who is, who is, is, uh, is the, um, uh, the type commander 
who is now, uh, and underneath him is the Undersea Warfare Development Command. And so we have the Surface and Mine Warfighting Development Command, the Air Warfighting Development Command, and the Undersea piece. And what I have now that I didn't really have before was, and, and, and Kil uh, Rear Admiral Kilby and his outfit worked directly for me as the type commander. And so as, as I uh, work my way through the war gaming piece and where we're going in the future and I see vulnerabilities, I have, a, I have an individual that I can go directly to and then he can cross with whether it's Rear Admiral Khan or the, or the, or the new commander of the Intersea Warfare Development Command in order to be, especially on the ASW side of the house, in order to be able to work uh, the, um, the cross-community pieces that we really haven't had in the past. And so I see, from my perspective, the institution of the Surface and Mine Warfighting Development Command is really a, a big step forward in getting tactics front and center in the surface warfare community, not only on the ASW and on the mine side of the house, but also on the, on the integrated air and missile defense side of the house and on the ASUW side of the house as well. So I see it, and I see a, a, a much greater synergy associated with that. Spreading it around over here. Question? Yeah. Hi, my name is Laura. I'm a reporter from Inside Defense. So there's been a lot of talk recently about um, a carrier gap in potentially the Persian Gulf. Um, and there's been talk about um, potentially extending the Roosevelt's deployment um, in order to mitigate that gap. So from your perspective, what are the concerns that you have about the domino effect that might have on maintenance and future deployments of aircraft carriers? Yeah, to be quite honest, I haven't, I, haven't, uh, I haven't really considered that. Can we redirect, though, to um, obviously it's the carrier and the carrier strike group, yeah. maybe just to uh, draft off that question and focus on your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing some of the same knock-on effects that have been talked about for the carriers where you're getting in a non-virtuous cycle of having to cut maintenance short and not be able to do uh, critical modernization given tight schedules. Yeah, we, we, I mean, we are continuously in a wrestling match between um, what is required in order to maintain uh, the material condition on the ship and the draw on our forces. And I, would, and I would submit to you that whether it's aircraft carriers, surface ships, or submarines, uh, the thing that I constantly hear is, we, we don't have enough of what it is uh, the combatant, combatant commanders certainly want to have, uh, want us to be able to deliver. And so, and so kind of what's front and center in my, in my plate from the, from the surf four and the surf pack commander's perspective is the balance between how much maintenance can we get, the, uh, can we get under the keel of the ship and, the, and raise the material condition to the appropriate level in order to allow the war fighters assigned to the ship to concentrate the the vast, vast majority of their efforts on building their warfighting capability so that when we do send them past, in my case, uh, out past Point Loma, uh, they're concentrating on the right things, which is the warfighting first aspect as opposed to trying to, to maintain the material condition of the ship. And um, certainly in, in from uh, on the non-nuclear surface floor side of the house, it's a very close partnership between us and our private yards. And, uh, and the dialogue is very robust. And uh, in order to ensure that we can get the ships in on time to the maximum extent that we can and get them out on time, but certainly there is some, there is a constant dialogue that's going on between me and, the third, in my case, the third fleet commander, the operational commander, to get the ships ready to go so I can hand him what I refer to as the product, the man trained and equipped ship, so that he can then take them to the next level and they can deploy confident. Okay, um, Megan? Hi, Megan Eckstein with USNI News. Uh, going back to distributed lethality, you mentioned during last year's war game uh, that you noticed some behavior changes in your commanders when they had up gun ships. I wonder how you go about um, trying to measure that behavioral change and kind of how that may be incorporated into education or training and tactics, um, how you would deal with that. Yeah, I think uh, what, what really what has to happen, I think, is more gaming and then, ta and then taking it into the, uh, uh, pulling the analytical, the, uh, uh, um, simulation and analysis into it in order to be able to provide a, a more rigorous mathematical underpinning as to, the, it to, to say, hey, was this unique in this behavior change that we saw, or in fact, does it drive, would it drive change uh, 99 times out of 100 or whatever the case may be? And so part of the drive has to be you war game something, you kind of see how the people react, and then you go ahead and execute the analysis, the rigorous analysis, to ensure that, 
hey, what the behavior changes that you're seeing are supported by, um, supported by, the, uh, by the analytical side of the house. I saw Tom Marfiak go into his cruiser CO mode and steal the mic. So my, I guess the next question is Tom Marfiak. Good afternoon. Hey, you didn't think you were going to get away free. Um, Sir? Thank you for a great discussion, Tom. Uh, while you we were talking about distributed lethality, I guess a number of thoughts were running through my mind. One of the things, the terms that we bandy about in our world a great deal is balance, space, awareness. You know, and I don't Sir? think everybody appreciates what that really means, but the surface forces certainly do because we get to have that uh, as a development of all of our sensors and, right. uh, because we get there and we spend time constructing it where we know what it is and how it changes from minute to minute. Sure. So that's part of our persistence benefits that we get from being here. Sure. So you take battle space awareness and then you put it with something called hostile intent. Question. In some of the environments we operate in, like the South China Sea or the Black Sea environment, or even up in the Arabian Gulf, can be in a state of becoming. Mm -hmm. and we don't know how that's going to work. So that brings me to the thing which I hope your wargaming is going to look at with respect to distributed lethality, and that's the role of rules of engagement, because they determine how we can respond and to what degree. It's key and essential that we have that in mind because we're frequently in a position where our actions could result in an expansion of a conflict or right. initiation of a conflict. Escalation or de-escalation. The United States doesn't want to get into So is, is that the question that are we including the ROE in, in the analysis? Right. The ROE has to be part of the analysis, right? I, th I think the, well, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, uh, the rules of engagement, and I, I think that you also have to look at, uh, at the... Um, at the application of the organizing principle across the phases of the operation. Clearly, the rules of engagement that we execute in phase zero is something different than the rules of engagement that we might execute in the latter phases of the operation. And so certainly, the, I think that is a significant aspect of it as you, kinda, as you start to deconstruct it. Yes, sir. OK. Um, in the back there. Admiral? Hey, Rob. It's good to see you up there. Um, you know, uh, with the FCC making such an effort to continue to buy up the frequency spectrum that SPY operates in, are you concerned in your training hat with the impact that may have on the fleet as we prepare to, as our philosophies are to train like we fight? I, I think absolutely. Um, um, the, anytime you lose spectrum, especially I think on the SPY side of the house, it's got to be a concern. Um, and uh, uh, and, it and, it and it has a tendency then to go push us into places that then costs more time, people, you know, t specifically time and money, in order to be able to get to those areas where you can operate and be able to train like you fight. And then that kind of takes you also away from the assets that you're going to utilize on the beach in order to be able to go do that. And so I think it's going to it's going to continuously be a, a kind of a uh, an ebb and flow. And I think it's important from the military perspective to ensure that we uh, properly and appropriately articulate the negative impacts associated with, with any impact to, to, the, to, the, to the sale of the spectrum that occurs. A question here in the fourth row. Hi, my name is Hampton Dellum. Um, the notion of distributed lethality and distributing the force uh, kind of brings me back to you know the, the, the comments and writings of folks like Spruance and Fletcher and Sumwalt and so forth. And, you brought up the idea about you know having to be there. Well, it really gets down to numbers, you know, hull numbers. I mean, can you be there? Um, and obviously, being there puts a stress on maintenance and the things that uh, drive your your daily calendar. Um, what about the notion? Uh, and I, I read a couple articles that were surfaced by some uh, junior officers, but I didn't see any comments coming back. Various publications. What about the idea of integrating permanently integrating foreign navies into our battle groups? I mean, they've seen the idea of putting Marines on foreign ships, and the Commandant Marine Corps recently thought about deploying Marine Corps assets on foreign ships as part of a normal deployment, uh, because we just have, a, we have some gaps, and that's not going to be filled for a while. It puts stress on maintenance. Would there would be there some advantages, generally speaking, in the aggregate of having permanent, not just in and out with an exercise, but in the, you know, the Ike battle group, they would have two, you know, a Brit, an Australian ship, par permanent part of the battle group lowering the numbers of our hulls, you know, for a certain period of time that would give you some breathing room 
terms of modernization and you know allowing our force numbers to uh, our hull numbers to grow is that idea come up I mean we, we go in and out of pack rim exercises but this would be more of a, a permanent integration you know it's a political issue but in terms of numbers and relief from a, a fiscal perspective and operating tempo would that would that give you some breathing room I think uh, I mean I, I, it's very difficult to deal in hypotheticals I would say and, and putting the political piece aside I don't see any uh, I don't see any um, um, uh, barriers to certainly some of the some of the uh, closer allies that we have the um, um, the sh uh, the ships that are uh, uh, in the Japanese force the ships that are in the Korean force the ships that are in the um, uh, in the Australian force uh, certainly I think the ability to integrate them into the strike group is not something that's insurmountable by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but I think that before really you can start to drive down that road, you kind of have to get back to political piece, get by the political piece, and I would say specifically the national opcon piece, um, because I mean clearly as I deployed as or as I prepared for deployment as a, as a strike group commander, there was no doubt in my mind ever that everybody that was in that was in that strike group they were 100% all in, and uh, and so I think that political piece is just one that you have to kind of get past. Okay, I think we have time for uh, maybe one or two more. Go ahead. Right here in the middle. So, hey, Mike. Hi, Admiral. Good to see you. Um, for distributed lethality, there was talk about putting a railgun, for example, on board joint high-speed vessel. Any consideration to putting a, the missile that you're talking about on ships either like joint high-speed vessel or perhaps other MSC kind of ships to again spread things out even further and if so then how do you deal with the uh, the civilian manning? Well, uh, certainly I think that that's something that you have to that you have to um, I mean quite obviously it has to be addressed um, and I'm not talking about uh, I, uh, in the day-to-day -day phase zero operation and the execution of operations uh, obviously, I think as the crisis level ratchets up, um, do you want to have in your kit bag the option or the opportunity in order to be able to start continuing to further spread the field? And then obviously that is one of the key things that has to be, that key questions that has to be answered or addressed is if you decide to go in that direction, then how are you going to address this piece with respect to the, the, um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, who's manning the ship? We and we do have examples. For example, um, uh, there are weapons installed on Mount Whitney, and there's a there's a synergy between the MSC crew, which basically operates the ship, and then the and then the, the Navy captain who who fights it. Um, and so that's I mean that not that that's necessarily a model, but that's one that we would obviously I think have to leverage I think as we as we address that question. Let's spread it over here, sir. Uh, thank you, Marvin Ott, ah, Johns Hopkins University, formerly National War College. Uh, in the South China Sea, you're looking at a growing Chinese presence in the form of low, al low elevation uh, construction, creating artificial islands, military positions, and so on. Can you give this uh, audience some sense of, given everything you've said about distributed lethality and, and the sort of rapidity of the adjustments you're making, how that competition is going from a professional's standpoint. Do you feel confident you can cope with what you see the Chinese doing in the South China Sea? The competition standpoint. That's an interesting characterization, um, I think, of what we're seeing in the South China Sea. Um, clearly, uh, you can pick, I think, pick up any of the number of publications on a daily basis and kind of track the progress that, of what's being executed in the South China Sea today. I think clearly uh, the uh, strategic importance of the South China Sea, given the trade routes and given the amount of energy and other goods that, that flow through there, um, uh, uh, the strategic importance of that particular body of water. I think what we have to work our way through is uh, in, the, in the whole presence piece, we have to understand, and, and clearly it's about, I think, about preventing conflict and continuing to ensure that the flow of goods that feed the world continue to flow through that body of water. Um, the intentions, I, I mean, I've read the intentions. I, I mean, 
of, uh, of, of what the Chinese intend with respect to those uh, islands that they're building. Um, I'm not sure I'd characterize it as much, as a, as, as much of a competition as it is uh, just trying to understand how people see the future of that body of water vis-a-vis -vis the strategic importance of all those things that move through that body of water. OK, maybe one final one over here. It's, good. it's always good to get a lieutenant raise his hand. <laughs> good afternoon, sir, Lieutenant Babcock. You want to know what your next assignment is? I'll take care of that. <laughs> Depends no, on this question. No, I'm kidding. Currently, we operate with a very rigid um, carrier-centric command structure uh, with the sea combatant commander on the carrier. Uh, when you're implementing distributed lethality, how does that change the game for command and control? They'll have a lot less situational awareness when ships are further away from them. Yeah, I think um, certainly one of the things we have to look, for, look, uh, look at as we continue to develop this concept is to understand what different, uh, and I'll just refer to it as adaptive force packaging we can put together, and what kind of C2 we need to have on those, on those force packages. Cur I mean, clearly, I think the, the, the command and control structure that we have in our carrier strike groups is uh, tried and true, and it's proven, and I think it's, I think, I think it's effective. But if we were to employ, put different groups of ships together and employ them differently, then obviously there has to be a command and control structure associated with them. So I could, I could envision a time when if we, had, if we decided that we were going we to deploy a smaller package, we would have to then either go take an existing command and control package, a, 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 for example, a destroyer squadron commodore that, was, uh, that uh, could, could command and control that particular group of uh, ships, uh, or some other, or amphibious squadron, or whatever the case may be, in order to be able to provide that command and control. If you're going to look at deploying different adaptive force packages, I think you have to then absolutely address that particular question, which is how you execute the proper C2 of them. Before we uh, sign off with uh, Admiral Roden, I want to again thank uh, our partner, CSIS, uh, for helping us uh, do jointly this Maritime Security Dialogue Series. We thank our sponsor overall, Lockheed Martin. I'd like to point out for the audience that we're going to do two of these next month in August. On the 5th of August, we're going to have Vice Admiral Joe Acoin and Rear Admiral Matt Winter come in together and talk about innovation. And on the 12th of August, we're going to have Lieutenant General Doug Davis, U.S. Marine Corps, and Vice Admiral Troy Schumacher talk about the naval aviation version of what we've heard here today. But more, most importantly, we want to thank Admiral Roden for coming out, giving us his fine presentation, and making himself available. Thank you very much. Sure.